Thank you. All right, good morning. <clears throat> yes, I drew the shortest straw. I know what you're thinking, but it's fine. I'm excited to be here. I'm Ritesh. I am vice president of member services for Brand Innovators. And um, if you don't know what member services is, again, like Lauren, come find me. You have a couple of hours today. But we work directly with our marketers that are on some of the biggest brands in the world to some of the more startup brands. And we help them with business objectives. We understand their priorities. And then we make some matches. We you know, put them in touch with some really innovative companies and marketers within our community so that they can learn from each other and use the opportunity to actually enhance their knowledge. So very excited to be here. I'm normally based in Toronto. This is my fifth trip to New York in the last three months, so LaGuardia and I are good friends. Um, and uh, I got to say, the airport is stunning. Um, I know it wasn't like that a long time ago, but I guess I started coming here at the right time. So thank you so much. Without further ado, I'd love to introduce my panel. I'm going to go left to right. We have Jordan Rost from Roku. Jordan, please join us. <clears throat> Kelsey Rover from Edelman. Lauren Douglas from Channel Factory and Jeannie Scalzo from Paramount Global. All right. Well, welcome all. Thank you for being here. Um, now, before we begin, I, I always say um, there will be a, a glitch today that is unplanned. So it'll be somewhere. We don't tell you when it is, but there will be. So when that happens, just bear with us. All right. Is that cool? Thank you so much. All right. Let's get started. So. I'd love for you guys to do a quick introduction. Um, you know, tell us a bit about your role and you know, more about your organization, obviously. And uh, yeah, let's get started with you, Jordan. Great. Good morning, everyone. Great to be here. Thanks to the Brand Innovators team. Uh, my name is Jordan Rost. I head up the ad marketing team at Roku. Roku is America's number one TV streaming platform. We really have three businesses. We power TVs that hopefully some of you have in your living rooms. Um, we have great content produced by ourselves and great partners like Paramount and others. Um, and uh, we sell advertising. And so I cover marketing for the, the latter half of that. Love it. Thank you, Jordan. Morning, everyone. I'm Kelsey Rover. Um, I have the very fun and weird job of doing PR for a PR firm. <laughs> um, but what most people don't know about Edelman is half of our business comes from creative branding, um, like traditional advertising. Um, so that's the part of the business that I look after, um, just you know, full funnel marketing function. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Douglas. I run marketing at a company called Channel Factory. Um, we help brands buy safe media on the internet, and I run our global marketing team, so I s oversee all of the functions from comms to events, et cetera. Good morning, everyone. Jeannie Scalzo. I work at Paramount, formerly Viacom CBS, formerly Viacom, <laughs> formerly MTV <laughs> Networks. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm in vogue with every other major media company. Um, so I run um, brand partnerships and sponsorship strategy, working very closely with our uh, kind of brand executives, managing each you know brand uh, cable brand, um, and our sales executives, coming up with new, um, different, unique ways to intrigue Madison Avenue. Um, and that requires a lot of look back to see what we've done well and what we haven't done well and really pushing forward um, with today's fast-paced changes. Well, thank you so much. Again, thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. So let's get started with a really serious question right off the bat. Um, <clears throat> if you had a walk-up song that we could have played for you as I introduced you and brought you up on stage, what, what would that have been, Jordan? Uh, this may date myself a little bit, but uh, Where the Streets Have No Name by U2. Oh, nice. Very nice good. epic builds. Very good. Yeah, that's a, that's a classic album. You can't go wrong with that. Um, mine would be Don't Stop Me Now by Queen. Wow. Okay. <laughs> All right, our trade marketing team. Why are we taking notes? This is valuable information. All right, go ahead, Lauren. All right, mine would be Diva by Beyonce. No. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Uh, in my quest to stay youthful, um, Lizzo and good as hell. I mean, that's a list right there. Wow. Okay. I, I, would, I would be like Phil Collins or something, you know, <laughs> groovy kind of love. I'm kidding. <clears throat> but uh, that's great. Well, thank you. I mean, uh, because it helps us understand the personalities of, of, of the guests that we have in front of us. Um, great. So today's topic, right, tentpoles, 
from strategic vision to on-site execution. What does that mean? So I think what we wanted to talk about was the world of events and the role they play in our marketing mix has changed significantly over the last two to three years. And so, you know, we have major advertisers here who work with brands directly in some very interesting partnerships. Um, and so what we're attempting to do today is to uncover a bit of the behind the scenes, what goes into planning for one of these events, why certain decisions are made to go big or to go small, um, or to sit on the sidelines. Um, what are some benefits you know, of participating in these big events versus the logistical challenges? And of course, in speaking with marketers every day, we know that ROI is you know, first and foremost, and for you as you're investing your own dollars, you know, what does ROI look like for you guys? You know, what are some success metrics when you go to an event or you present and you know, you're there as an own property or not? What are some things that are interesting for you? So I think just to give you a, a little bit of a, an agenda, this is what we'll, we'll be talking about today. So why don't we start, um, first question would be, you know, from the perspective of, of 10 poles, what does that even mean? Because you know, it's like one of, those, one of those words, right? If I asked five people in the audience, you're going to give me different definitions. So why don't we start with that? I'll start this time with Jeannie. Um, so what does, what does that mean to you? Yeah, it's interesting because for years we've been trying to define what a tent pole is. Um, so for me uh, at Paramount, it really means something that happens annually. It could be a live event, could be a you know a long form um, content or a series, but attracts the masses, right? And with that, um, fandoms come from those masses, right? And the social conversation surrounding it. So that's a tent pole to me, you know, live or a show. That's a good definition. Anyone would like to add your own version of what does so Lauren? I thought that was perfectly Yeah, it was really well done. It's <laughs> like it was it was well rehearsed, well done. You almost had the question before I asked it. <laughs> Go ahead, Kelsey. Oh no, I, I think that's a great definition. I think it's anything cultural, a conference, any kind of big moment that kind of brings the whole industry together. I also think a tent full is something that really drives conversation. So it's a moment where we kind of all gather to talk about a specific topic. And I know one of the things we look for is I cover the more B2B aspects, talking to marketers and partners. We like to tie our tent poles to major cultural moments as well. And the confluence of those two things is really powerful. We can make interesting conversations happen um, and ultimately create more interesting moments. Yeah. And, you know, actually, just one other note I wanted to, to add here is that multiple flavors of tent poles, right? There are tent poles that you go to that are not your own, but in some of your cases, you actually have your own tent poles, right? And so I think, as you know, keep that in mind as, as we go through our conversation today, because we'd love to hear a flavor of what that looks like, you know, especially for you, for you Jordan, and I think, Jeannie, for you as well. Um, so, okay, let's, let's talk about now that we all agree on what a tent pole is, um, what is, what goes into the planning of this? Like how far ahead do you guys begin? Because obviously this is like a, there's a very seasonal element to this, right? There is the big things that happen every year. There is a CES and, you know, South by, um, you know, Super Bowl and, and on and on it goes and can obviously. Um, so what are some, some planning elements versus events that are smaller, but you might have, you know, a different role on them. So why don't we start with you, Jordan? Yeah, I mean, so first and foremost, we use our tent poles to obviously mark the calendar, and those are the things, that, as we just discussed, elevate the rest of the plan. Um, so in some ways, they force good hygiene of planning well and planning ahead. We know when these things are going to happen, and so uh, it gets our, our all of our ducks in a row. I think the biggest thing for us is we use these as major moments to understand what is the crux of that moment. For Can, I still think of it as a very much a creativity fest. Obviously, there's a lot of other folks who've joined in that conversation as well. And so we really think about really understanding what's that community about and what is our role in that community. And so we try to orchestrate all the different things we may want to either talk about ourselves or invite partners into to, to, to join us with and make sure that we're being relevant to that community that we're joining. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that you mentioned community because, of course, that's what Brand Innovators is all about, and that's one of the things that we've really tried to do over the last 11 plus years, I can say now. Um, but no, thank you for, for adding those thoughts. Any any bills on that? Lauren, you're looking at me. Yeah, no, I, I think that's spot on, Jordan, about community. I think that if you aren't finding what the voice or the authentic um, nature of that event is, then you can sort of get disconnected from it and you remove yourself a few levels. And so if you just go back to sort of the core of like, 
yeah, can is about creativity. Let's have conversations about creativity. Let's activate in a way that brings creativity to life. Um, and if you get the further away you get from that, the more disingenuous I think it can be. Yeah, absolutely. How about just the differences in planning for an event like that versus like even from a team perspective, right? Like um, because objectives are different, obviously, um, at these big events versus the smaller. Is like any actually for you, Kelsey, given that there's not an owned tentpole for you, but you certainly participate. Um, and being a global, you know, the size of the company you have, like what are some differences for you when you're actually planning for these events? Well, so I think when I'm kind of mapping out the year, I have, th I have a specific vetting criteria. So I'm, I want to consider if this event will either, you know, drive business for Edelman, if we can recruit talent. And then the third is just a value add for our employees and our clients. I think we all saw during the pandemic, like the growing role of the employee is you know, becoming more and more important and we wanna make sure that they feel recognized. So I think as we're planning, that's sort of how I'm mapping out. That's my like green light, red light. Yeah. Um, and I think generally, I think you asked about like large scale versus small and I, I actually try to integrate the two. Um, and this is par partly why Brand Innovator is such a good partner is because at these massive tent poles, you know, it's a battleground for attention. And so I really look to kind of cultivate an off-campus fringe activity that can kind of draw the people out that we really want to talk to. Um, so I try to do both at once. Very good. Well, the check is in the mail, in case you're wondering. <laughs> uh, but thank you. That's, that's a great answer. Jeannie, I think for you, it's interesting because you have so many properties that potentially could be integrated into cultural moments. I know in our planning conversation, we talked about Yellowstone. We did. Um, can, you, can you give us a little bit of a flavor as to what that has meant you know, for you guys and, and the kinds of conversations that that has spawned? Yeah, um, so you know, big and small. I mean, we just executed um, the VMAs a couple of weeks ago, um, and you asked like how far out or what's the planning cycle. We're already talking about the VMAs for next year, evaluating what we did for our partners. You know, last time around, and it was um, we felt really proud because there were three advertisers who converted their commercial time into co-branded, um, you know, branded spots that we made together with them. So that was a that was a big deal. And also, depending on the city, we take in the flavor of the city and expose the city in a certain way um, and work with you know, uh, the, the, the various departments in, in the cities that we go to. Yellowstone is a different animal. You know, we have been thinking about and talking about and planning for Yellowstone for months now. You know, there's a certain amount of viewers that we're hoping to achieve. And we've got, you know, our packages, um, you know, pretty much sold and set. So we're really working with our advertisers to help promote the show. Um, but also, they want to be a part of Yellowstone and the phenomenon that it's creating. So, yeah, it's been going on for a while. So actually, just this is the interactive portion of the event. Um, just by show of hands, how many of you are Yellowstone fans or at least have watched? Yeah, see, that's, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there will be a follow-on conversation about Yellowstone if you just stay on after the event today. And your checks will are in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There, that could be our hashtag for today, everyone. Social media, let's take notice of that. Um, so I think um, I love what you said, Kelsey, about the goals. So I think just to remind everyone, and so that I was listening, right? You're, I think you talked about what does this mean for your customers? What does it mean from a, from a talent attraction perspective? And the third thing that I am now... Generating new business. Generating new business. It makes a lot of sense. There is, there is new business. There is active customers today or, or um, you know, your, your people that you work with every day and what value brings them. And then the talent side. Um, so this isn't necessarily something we would, like we said we would talk about, but since that's come up a bit, like what does that look like, the recruitment side of things? Like are you, you guys walk away with that at an event like this with like actual, you know, really awesome leads and some really cool talent? Like just, I'm, I'm just wondering curiously. Is that, is that, has, has that happened lately? I think, when we show up at Cannes, that's definitely a goal for us. Um, I, the best creative talent in the world is at Cannes. And so if we can meet them there and, and just have those conversations, um, I, I don't have any specific anecdotes. No, um, but I, I do think, at, you know, candidly, it has been successful. I think for Edelman especially, we have such a fixed, I mean, we're a 70-year-old company. We have such a fixed reputation in the industry. And so by showing up at these places, we really try to show up in a way that people won't expect. Yeah. Um, cr even being creative, I think, kind of blows people's minds still, which is kind of sad. But I think, you know, just by showing up and being different, we automatically attract a different kind of talent, a different kind of customer. Yeah. 
No, that was just, I'm, I was just curious because it, it's absolutely true. In, in fact, a lot of events that we host as well, um, where we have a brand host, that usually is a secondary objective of a lot of those things is to say, look, we have an awesome space. We have amazing roles to fill and we'd love to talk to you, right? I think that's that's great that it's very similar. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to show up at CultureCon this year, which is new for us. It's in, in New York in October. Um, and that is pure play talent recruitment. Nice. I love that. Okay. Well, I will say, I mean, these for us, at least the, the big moments are huge retention plays yeah. as well, especially the last few years. A lot of our employees have joined the company during the pandemic. And so to have a major moment like our upfront yeah. really galvanize, why did I join this company? What are we building towards has been really impactful. Right. Yeah. And Lauren, actually, I wanted to ask you because we, we met briefly in Austin at South by when you were doing that awesome video series. Yeah. Right. Let's talk a little bit about that, because that's an interesting it's a different way of getting part of a tentpole experience. Can you just give us sure. a brief synopsis? I think it was a really, really cool thing that you guys were doing. Yeah. So um, in the pandemic, we couldn't do events anymore. And that was a key part of my strategy. So I said, well, how could we potentially create connection between people in a way that is remote? So we started doing this YouTube show. We do a lot of YouTube advertising, so it made sense. And at first, it was really, really bad. So if you ever go <laughs> check it out, some of the videos are like, ooh. Um, and then we just threw enough spaghetti against the wall that finally it started to, to, to be really good and really positive. We partnered with brand innovators at South by Southwest, and we interviewed um, senior brand marketers from the CMO of, um, you know, Peps, uh, sorry, from the CMO of Pizza Hut to the head of marketing for AT&T, et cetera. And I think what it did for us was it took that tentpole moment, it sliced it down into pieces of content that we could distribute across the web. We could open up the experience to other people and it put our brand next to these brand marketers, which was um, incredibly valuable for us as a B2B brand. You know what, as an observer, because we were sharing the space with you at the time, I was like, these are really good questions and really good answers. So that's why I went, oh, it's really cool. Yeah, good job. Um, great. So actually, let's transition a little bit. Um, this is more, I mean, you talked about the pandemic, uh, Lauren, and obviously we're all coming out of it. We're tired of talking about it. I get it. Um, it's two years past. I don't know what phase we're in now. This is post-pandemic phase three, four, Omicron, Delta, Phi, I don't know where we are, uh, but we are somewhere. We're past the point. We're clearly back in person. Um, you know, we've had in the New York area alone probably seven to eight events just in the last two months. Um, I know again, LaGuardia and me are best friends um, as we have talked. So, f coming out of the pandemic, how has that planning process changed for you? Because obviously, there was no option. You know, to go to these events. These events weren't even happening, right? But yet, marketing needs to continue. In fact, I would argue it's even, you know, a greater role. Um, so, how has that changed for you now that we're starting to come back into person? So, Jeannie, maybe you can get us going. Like, one example of, of through the pandemic, how you kept the conversation alive, and then, you know, what does that look like coming out of it and as you plan for more in person stuff? Well, I think the role of um, social in the conversation and fandoms played a huge part of it. Um, so, you know, the VMAs and the Kids' Choice Awards continued, maybe not with big audiences, but we had to really make it feel like um, the fans were a part of the experience and a part of the conversation. Um, so that's from, you know, kind of a, a bigger tentpole uh, feel. For Yellowstone, you know, the pandemic and people home watching kind of helped if there's a benefit of what we're living through that would be the benefit you know we knew we had the middle of the country and then we started marketing to the coasts um, so and I imagine most of you are from the coast so those of you who didn't raise your hands please watch um, because <laughs> that's how we you know that's how we were able to get you know um, a big um, following for Yellowstone um, really capturing on you know those hot levels and putt levels rising yeah. oh, thank you Jordan? Yeah, I would say we certainly invest heavily in planning and activating at major ten poles, but we also make sure that we've got good strings connecting right. them, and the things that we say at those ten poles need to continue and be consistent with everything else we're saying in between, and so we build campaigns that cross tent poles, and so I think a good example is I think holiday is a major tent pole for many advertisers. This is actually the first week of holiday season, according to us. It's when elf searches for elf start spiking on Roku. And so we know that, OK, kids are back to school. Here come the holidays. Um, but realistically, the holiday has become a 24-hour-a-day, 12-month-of-the-year, certainly, yeah. calendar event for us. And so when we think about our conversations at CES, all the way through our upfront, 
to can to now, um, that becomes a through line that connects a lot of those things. So prior to can this year, we announced a partnership with Walmart to enable the purchases of products sold through Walmart on our TV screens. Uh, so super interesting use of creativity, a lot of technology powering that. We're through a cycle now where we're going to really start to show the fruits of some of that experimentation and start to talk to retailers and manufacturers about do people actually want to buy things from their TV screen? And so we're continuing that journey six, 12 months yeah. beyond the initial planning phase. Wow. I mean, I think the only people in the audience who are surprised by a holiday conversation popping up in September are Costco shoppers <laughs> um, because they start selling Halloween costumes in March. Um, I <laughs> walk into a Costco and go, what is going on? Um, but clearly, we're in holiday period right now. Sorry, you had a question, Babs. No, you're agreeing with me. Awesome. <laughs> well, well, that's good. That's one. Um, would you like to add? I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Like, tent poles are great. But again, first of all, from a resource perspective, it takes a lot out of your own teams. It takes, there's a lot of planning. There's a, I mean, everything from, from people, money, um, and all of the marketing collateral that goes into it, et cetera. So it makes a ton of sense for someone like you to actually have the always on evergreen stuff that actually connects it. What does that look like for you, Kelsey? Well, it's funny. I think post pandemic, I've seen a huge surge in just the number of, there are more and more conferences. I think my October alone is just terrifying. <laughs> um, and so, you know, we're trying to be more and more selective about, about what we're doing. And I think as an attendee, you know, you, you're also being very selective about what, what your, what conferences you're going to. Um, and I, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> totally fine. I was just saying, what does the evergreen, evergreen. sort of look like yes, for you, you know, you. In between some of these bigger... So yeah. Edelman's tent pole, if we had one, is our trust barometer report, uh, which comes out every January. We launch it at Davos, and then we do our big brand trust report every year at Cannes. So our tent pole strategy is really driven by our IP. And so, for example, last year, we did a massive report on Gen Z. It was our first one ever. And so we aligned that launch to VidCon. The first time Edelman had ever showed up at VidCon, my favorite anecdote from that was <laughs> the, the biggest Please. question we got was, what's Edelman? And for us, that's such a rich moment yeah. because to imagine someone who's never heard of you and to be able to like write the record from the very, very beginning, the very first interaction, that was really powerful and special for us. Um, and so we, but generally speaking, yes, we align all of our IP to big temple events. Right. Yeah, makes sense. Um, Lauren, for you, it's I'm sure it looks a little bit different, right? So what does that, like in terms of obviously being at tent poles, but then what does that, what does those smaller in-between moments look like for you? Yeah, I mean, I think just to the, to the tent pole thing, like we had talked earlier about coming out of the pandemic. One of the things that I'm focusing on is uh, this year was like throwing spaghetti against the wall. Right. To Kelsey's point, like there's a million conferences and like I'm getting a million emails and inundated. I'm sure you guys are too with like, you should attend this, you should sponsor this, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, holy shit, there's just too much sometimes I think to even like make sense of. Um, so this year was a lot of like, well, what's going to work, what's not? And we're having our 23 planning conversations now and now going to go back and edit that. So now I think like next year will be very curated what people decide to do from a temple perspective. Um, but just to, the, to, to your question about like the in-between, I think a lot of what Kelsey said makes sense, which is like your own IP, your own research. How do you make sure that you've got a thought leadership strategy in place that kind of carries you through these tent poles so that you have something like authentic to ladder up to? Right. Yeah, no, that's that's a, it's a really good build. And uh, because, again, these decisions are happening constantly, um, right? You're getting bombarded, like you said, and in-person events are coming back. It's, it's difficult to figure out where my audience is, what are the real, you know, where's the real value, which actually, as we get towards the end of our conversation, maybe a couple of points around, you talked about um, making decisions based on, you know, return. In, for brand marketers, that return, you know, is, it could be awareness, it could be conversions, it could be consideration. But those same elements apply to you too, right? So Jeannie, why don't we start with you? What, like from an ROI perspective, what is a successful event where you look at that, you, you do a, a, a post-event analysis with your team and you go, that was, that was a really good event. And what's that timeline look like for you? Well, we're still in the business of delivering overall, you know, um, ratings and viewership. So, um, and we can't, uh, you know, we have to include the portfolio of what we're bringing, you know, to a tent pole. So we really look at 
for the VMAs, for instance, it was total minutes consumed, um, which reached you know 1.6 billion. Or so wow. it's like a 14% increase versus the year before. I mean, people consume differently, obviously, and they're going to consume differently even next year versus this year, right? So um, it is about um, kind of the aggregate of what we can deliver, you know, to to a partner. Of course, there's, you know, revenue is a good indicator as well. Um, so I would say a combination, is, and as I've mentioned, not just Yellowstone, but with our other franchises, we have a certain goal, X percentage versus the year before, that we want to bring to the television landscape and beyond. So that's that's really the the RROI. Yeah. No, it's it's very interesting because it's very different. Like if I ask you the same question, obviously so some elements are very similar, but. It, almost like because you also own your own things like there so what does that look like for you how how does your team like what is the data play behind that actually says we did this event it was really successful but maybe it didn't quite hit so maybe next year we change our approach like how does that look yeah. like for you we generally use our 10 polls to borrow attention so for many we're a newer brand relative to a paramount certainly um so we're, in, we're having our first relationship start at many of our tent poles, and so we borrow their attention there, and then we use the rest of our calendar to earn their attention and our, eventually earn their business. And so um, we're meeting, introducing ourselves, getting them into our life cycle marketing, handing off things to our sales teams so that they can further the relationship in a lot of cases. And so it's the beginning of a lot of our relationships. In some cases, it's furthering relationships that we've had for decades. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I think we have, I want to make sure we leave time for questions. So I know you've been anxiously jotting down questions for this awesome panel, right? Don't let me down. Uh, but uh, before we go there, one question. So I wanted to, oh, Lauren, did you have something to build on that? No, you're good. Okay. So I had, I had an unplanned question. Like every skilled moderator, you want to surprise your panel. No, don't do that. Um, but I am going to ask a question. This is, it's very easy. All right. You guys do a lot of temples. Okay. You guys do small, big temples. Um, if you had your choice to have a music act <laughs> as a guest, uh, you know, because I was at an event a couple of weeks ago with the U.S. Open, and they said surprise music guest, and everyone went in. I was like, "Who's going on?" The stage was set up beautifully. It was the Jonas Brothers were performing um, that evening at the IAG U.S. Open party. But if you had your own, um, you know, sort of. And cost wasn't an issue. Who would you invite to be the opening act? Opening? I, she's the main act. main act. I would say Taylor Swift because my yes. daughters love her. And there we go. I think <laughs> I'm finally interested in my work for once. <laughs> <laughs> 1989 tour. Who? Anyone? Yes. Yes. That was, I took my daughters to that. This is, by the way, I just got to say how things have changed because when that tour wasn't that old, 1989 is probably five years ago, maybe. We were almost thrown out of the stadium in Toronto because we pulled our phone out to record a clip. And they said, no recording. And now the, the content creator mind has come in and said, no, actually, this is helpful to me. Right? I want you to spread word of my concert. Anyway, just a little side note. How about you, Kelsey? What would be your, is, your, your act? I have tunnel vision right now in part because of the Venice Film Festival, but also because I'm seeing him on Saturday. So I have to say Harry Styles. Oh, oh I love that. <laughs> Can't go wrong with that. Please I mean, how many? Me. <laughs> is show number 25 tonight or something in yeah, New York? Like, like some that. craziness. Yes. Lauren? Um, I always try to find uh, whether it's an act or whether it's like an execution, something that I think our specific audience would like. And so my answer is going to be like for all of these 80s babies, I would probably pick something like a Toto. Ah. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, I, I get it. See, she's thinking, we're all like, where are my favorite acts? <laughs> she's like, no, no, what is my audience interested in? Yeah, that's good. Jenny, any what what would be your choice? Yeah, well, if money wasn't an object, correct, it's never I, an object. And right? I could combine a couple of things together here. I would say Lady Gaga, Madonna, and a little bit of Pink flying in. Oh my gosh, that would be okay. By the way, if where where is uh, the people that make decisions on Super Bowl uh, halftime shows? Because that would be that would be a killer <laughs> halftime show. Uh, well, thank you all. This is great. I'd love to turn to the audience um, to see if there's any questions. Oh. Perfect. And please, you know, introduce yourself. Um, you don't have to tell us uh, the meaning of life, uh, but please introduce <laughs> yourself for sure. Hello. Uh, John Lopresto here, event director of Vine Technology. We're an air tech company based here in New York. Um, awesome panel, hyper relevant to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And a lot of things are, you know, just sparking plugs in my mind. Um, 
Jordan, you mentioned borrowed attention from these ten poles. We all show up at CES, Con, South by Adweek, New York, you name it. Uh, any, can anyone talk about experience about moving from sponsored to owned and operated ten poles? Kind of when is the time to you know getting the brand out there to start your own ten poles and create these bigger moments like the VMAs? I don't know that it's a choice necessarily. We've built, uh, I forget who mentioned this, but we've built kind of auxiliary experiences alongside major events as a way to start move, inching away, if you will. So people are still there for whatever the thing is, but you're creating your experience. That's an uh, extension of that. I think that's probably a great first step. Um, there's a lot of basic blocking and tackling of, do you have a good CRM system? <laughs> Can you get invitations out the door and really build an audience, which I think oftentimes is the hardest thing to do. Yeah, I would say having the right staff and having a vision. Um, the only when I was at 360i, they did a marketing summit for clients, and it was amazing. But you know that all our annual energy went into that one event. I mean, it was so so big. And so before Edelman jumps into you know doing our own event, I would want to make sure we had like a full team, um, and just having gone through all the um, the pain ahead of time, just to make sure it can be a success. Yeah, I mean, I think it's economies of scale. Like, if you have the size to be able to afford it because you're looking at a couple hundred thousand dollars, if not more price tag, um, then you have to make sure that that's going to be worth it to you. So it, could you take that two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand dollars and invest it into a big activation at can instead? That's sort of the trade-off, I think. I think that's well answered. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so for the much. question. Thanks. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, before you answer, I'm just going to repeat the question because I know it's, it's being recorded. I just want to make sure it's a really good question. So the question was, from a thought leadership perspective, um, you know, what are some tactics? What are some things that you're doing, whether it's in real life or online, uh, to be able to support thought leadership you know, as, 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 as you put out these events? So I think each piece of IP Edelman puts out has its own marketing plan. It's quite robust. You know, part of it is activating at Cannes or a major industry conference. We do a virtual um, event. Edelman's a global company, so we do a, a virtual event for all of our clients to hear the data first. We'll do a series of dinners. I think we did a tech report, Trust in Tech, and did a series of dinners along the West Coast. Um, there's also like a very in-depth online and like paid marketing strategy on LinkedIn. So what was interesting is during the pandemic especially, we saw a real vacuum and people just wanted information, wanted new data. And we actually published a new piece of IP every single month. Um, and that was an insane year for us, but there was such appetite for it that it just spoke for itself and we just kept doing that. We've since scaled back, um, thankfully. Um, but yeah, each piece of IP is like its own campaign, its own marketing it's function. Own yeah, exactly. <laughs> What kind of what, what kind of results? Like, do you specifically think, wow, this trust barometer is the reason our revenue went up thirty percent, or because we got these two clients? So, to get it into the tactical weeds for a moment, yes. So, we will take each piece of IP, we'll do client roadshows, and then we'll win new business off of whatever new data. So, Gen Z is a great example. We launched that. Um, first report in December last year and then just did another report in June and we've already I think have like two million dollars in projects off of that single piece of IP Great. yes and actually if you don't mind sure. could you yeah thanks it there's a nice spotlight it's a beautiful Instagram background Lovely. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Lauren Burke. I'm with Ogre, uh, an ad tech company focused on personified advertising. Um, my question is around um, your major tent poles. So um, obviously, especially if you're just getting started and dipping your toes um, in these waters, you want to drive attendance. Um, it's one thing to throw to the event, but you want people to show up and you want the right people to show up. So 
how do you put together a strategy around that? Like getting the right folks, the right kind of decision makers in the room. And once that you have them there, how do you kind of keep them engaged and, you know, turn them into like an ambassador of yours, really? I think the most important thing is to make sure that you're not throwing an event where you can't get people to show up. I definitely have had that conversation of late where like, do you guys think we can get people to come to this? Because if not, let's not invest the money. So I think that's question number one. Um, and then I think I, if anybody's really interested in like events and hosting, there's an amazing book by Priya Parker called The Art of Gathering. And she talks a lot about like, how do you pull together a unique space with a unique group of people and make sure that like everyone walks away with something and I think that if you can create something that's unique that someone can walk away with like oh yeah I remember that like I had this really interesting dinner where they sprayed this lemon spritz in the air to make me smell the food in a different way and whatever it might be to make that sort of like custom experience a little bit interesting or a little bit different or a little bit like throws them off a little I think that for me is what's always made me create brand ambassadors. I would wholeheartedly agree, create an event that people actually want to go to. Um, beyond that, we use um, you know, a platform like the VMAs and open it up for advertisers to use as their own launch pad. You know, so Burger King, um, a couple of weeks ago in the VMAs, changed their whole campaign from royalty, you know, and the king to, um, you know, something that, uh, to individuality, you know, and something we all can, you know, relate to and not something that's way over here. And they tapped into um, artists to do that. So it's really opening up the platform for other marketers to come in and, and join and be a part of it. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think we have time for one more. The right side of the room, not that I'm <laughs> counting or paying attention. Oh, yes, please, the center wins. You get the last word. <laughs> um, I was telling Babs I'm like the apple polisher sitting in the front row. Um, and I'm also short. Jean Meyer, I'm with Kite Hill PR. I'm the chief client officer. Hi, Lauren. Um, we're a B2B firm and we work with a lot of folks who are after the same thing. How do you justify spend on activations, which is so brand side and not performance driven, when you're in the season right now of budgeting and justifying that above the line spend? We try to make everything performance driven. So we have a long leash that we give the events. And so some of our events will take 12, 24 months to pay off. But we at least try to connect the dots and say, people that we engaged with or met with at an activation, what was the growth in relationship? And can we tie a dollar amount to that over a long enough period of time? And where the answers have been yes, we've been able to defend that spend and grow it. But can I just say, like, truthfully, there is a little bit of this when it comes to events. There just is. Some of your per percentage of your dollars, you don't know what the ROI is. <clears throat> I'd say it's just a lot of testing and learning. I think one of my strategies is I always try to do a recon, like send a, a, a SWAT team ahead of me um, in year one to just check it out, see if it's worth doing. And then the second year we'll go and, and do something bigger or we'll just send a few people again. So I just do a lot of testing and learning um, in order to determine if it's worth it or not. And I would say it's also historical. You know, if you have a track record with certain events, um, you know what's been done before. You know how, or you hope you can analyze how you can do it better. You know, and and better going forward. Fabulous. Well, thank you very much. We are 24 seconds over time, uh, so I met my ROI and my KPI. <laughs> I don't know about you, but that's what I'm being judged on. Well, thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.